Special emergency. My name is Mary Lyons. I'm the banking center manager. We have a lady who is in our bank right now who says that her husband and children are being held at their house. The, the people are in a car outside the bank. She is getting $15,000 to bring out to them that if the police are told, they will kill the children and the husband. Her name is Jennifer Pettit, P-E-T-I-T. -E okay, she's still in, is in the bank? Yes, she is. Okay, she's being held, her, 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 her husband, husband and family is being held? Yes. At their house? Yes, they're tied up. She said they drove her here. Okay. I'm trying to look and see where she's gone. She went outside, but I don't, oh wait, I see her walking now. She is petrified. Facts like that, I can't comment okay. on. All I can tell you right now is that we do have three confirmed fatalities. Uh, two female, and we're still checking. And a male survivor. Survivor was a male. And you're talking? Upon arrival, Officer Pettit was asked to leave the scene. Okay, Officer Pettit, what's your name? Upon arrival at the victim's residence, the first officer observed two male subjects exit private residence and also observed the private residence fully engulfed in flame. The suspect vehicle rammed the Cheshire police officer's car and continued on Sorghum Mill Road. Tonight, police removed the body of one of the victims after a home invasion leaves a mother and her two daughters dead. The suspects, 26-year-old Joshua Komazarjewski of Cheshire and 44-year-old Stephen Hayes of Winstead, were caught while trying to escape in the Pettit's car. Now, the only question remains that why did this happen to the Pettit family? There's not one word that I can use to describe our town, but it's a phenomenal town. It's known as the bedding capital of Connecticut for bedding plants. It was historically a farming community, a lot of family farms. As the state of Connecticut grew, as the cities surrounding the town of Cheshire grew, it, it ultimately became a, a bedroom community, which I think is the uh, probably the way most people think of Cheshire. story a mother and her two daughters are dead their father severely injured after a home invasion stunned the town of cheshire the suspects apparently set the house on fire as well as some of the victims jennifer pettit her cause of death has been asphyxiation from strangulation her daughters haley and michaela died from smoke inhalation phone call here on Monday afternoon from Billy's sister and I said Hannah it's about the girls isn't it and she said these two men came in at what they think was three o'clock in the morning and they beat Billy really badly with a baseball bat and his heads all split apart and then they proceeded to do all these awful things to the girls 
and they tied them to their beds. About nine o'clock, Jen was made to go to the bank and withdraw money. And then when she came back from the bank, they set the house on fire and killed them all so that they could try to cover up their tracks, I guess. But they got the two guys. And all I could think was, who cares if they got the two guys? We don't have our loved ones anymore. And that's all we had. Wild lingonberry. Have you ever had that? Lingonberry. It's from England somewhere. Okay. The hardest thing I think I've ever had to do in my life was to tell my parents that one of their other children, their only other child, was dead. And their two grandchildren, two of their four, she quickly told us that the home was set on fire, but Bill escaped. We went to the hospital and got to see Bill for the first time. He was badly beaten, and he tried to apologize to us for not saving our daughter and, uh, and our grandchildren. And we had to convince him that he was in no condition to be able to save anyone, and we were grateful. That he was alive. That he was alive. Right. This was the last sort of picture that we had together. My sister, she was beautiful, and she was usually like the lead in the plays at school. She was on the homecoming court. She was captain of the Trojanette team. So she really was kind of like a winner person. Bill was a committed, dedicated doctor, would leave at uh, 7 o'clock in the morning and not be back home until maybe 9, 9.30. When Jen was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis, Haley really wanted to raise money because she felt like if she didn't do anything, it was possible that her mother could die. Haley was able to raise a little over $50,000 being a spokesperson uh, for the MS Society here in Connecticut, uh, receiving awards for that, although you'd never know it. I hardly knew about Haley helping with MS, and that was just because she was just so quiet about everything, and she could have bragged about everything she did. I mean, she was a straight-A student. I think about her all the time. It's hard not to think about her. You'll find just something to relate to her about. Michaela sometimes shied away from adults, but you know, if she saw somebody was having a difficult time, she went to them and tried to help with whatever she could. Their lives were just centered around a, a sense of sociability, uh, justice, and if I didn't smile about it, I'd have to cry. Apparently, these, these two losers followed Jennifer Hawk Pettit and her 11-year-old daughter to the Stop and Shop on Sunday night. They followed them. And... The first Cheshire police officer to arrive at the scene heard at least one of the girls screaming from inside the house. Those animals, what they did to those poor people uh, in Cheshire, uh, I can't even believe that they're going to give them a trial. Why, what kind of laws do we have in this state where they don't just execute those animals? Well, Tony, the, the, the reaction by the public certainly is for that, but it is... To destroy a family the way those two did, Heinous. My verdict, fry them, hang them, do whatever you got to do. Make sure they ain't going to walk this earth again. Can we switch? Yep. You need more? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't think evil like this has happened since in cold blood. I really don't, not that I know of. And we went from being a quiet, peaceful town in New England to overnight people installing alarm systems and panic buttons and panic rooms. 
people in town refer to it as Cheshire's 9-11. You know, life was one way and then it's another. God has promised to be with us through thing and through thing. All other ground is indeed sinking sand. Well, first of all, uh, thank you for all coming out today to honor the memory of the girls. Uh, I'd really like to say thank you to people from all over the state of Connecticut and all over the country. We've been surrounded with love and cards and flowers and prayer. Uh, from east to west and north to south. I met Jen at uh, Children's Hospital in Pittsburgh for med. She was a, a new nurse and I was the know-it-all third-year medical student. I was trying to correct Jen on how to take the blood pressure the correct way. <laughs> Since I had about three minutes of experience at that point, but it became clear pretty quickly that uh, she knew more about pediatrics and how to care for kids than I had ever known. One of the nice things in the Billy recent had was actually, never smelled smoke. He had never seen a fire. He had said that the only thing he ever heard of my sister was her like pleading nicely with these two men. Can you please? Let me get my purse or they'll know that something is up at the bank. He had his legs tied together and he hopped up the outside basement steps. And he said, but sometimes I wish I would have just gone to the inside because then maybe even if I had died in there, I could have done something. And I said, no, Billy, you couldn't have done anything. Attached to a pole with your hands and feet tied in the basement with about six to eight three to four inch openings in your skull. And we knew that the police did not help my brother-in-law out of the house. So the chances that he lived surviving the blood loss are just miraculous in my mind. Joining me on the phone right now is Lieutenant Jay Markella, the public information officer for the Cheshire Police Department. Thank you for joining us. Oh, thank you for having me. Very little detail coming out, though, about exactly what happened. Was it when police showed up that they found the house on fire and caught these suspects? Because they were caught leaving the burning house. Yeah, it, it worked out. So officers arrived on scene just as the suspects were leaving the residence. Okay. I don't know how far we should go back, but... I'm a very detective-like person. I like to know details and until I know the details around things, it's hard to figure things out. I would like to know why my sister and Stephen Hayes weren't stopped at the bank, why she wasn't held at the bank. There were some police officers that, off the record, said to people in the town that they heard the girls screaming in the end. Did they try to enter? Did they not try to enter? And why weren't there policemen looking in the windows? My sister had no blinds on her windows. I just want the facts. And nobody has told us what really happened. And today, a state prosecutor said he'll seek the death penalty for Commissar Jeski and Hayes. Today, the state charged the men with six counts each of capital felony murder. I was driving back uh, from the Adirondacks with my wife, c coming through the Berkshires, not a care in the world. And I get a cell phone call. Probably why I turned pale was because, you know, I had a sense as a lawyer where this was headed right from the beginning. 
you know, capital case, death penalty case, high profile. And in my own head, I knew right away that that case was coming into this office and that I'd be involved. Stephen Hayes and Mr. Komaszewski were coming into Meriden Court for arraignment. Right from the first time that we met, Stephen Hayes was suicidal, depressed, just doesn't really understand how this all happened. His record is lengthy. He's got all these burglaries. Most involve car burglaries, and this state burglary includes the break-in of a car. And they were all daytime. He'd sit and watch. People would park their cars. They'd go walking on a trail, break into their car and take a laptop or a radio or a phone. So you were not dealing with someone who had the kind of classic history of violence and all of a sudden stepped into the big time in terms of the next level of violence. You just didn't have it. There's no reason that anyone would ever look at that history and think, well, this guy's going to do something really bad one day. The first time that I found out about my dad, I was probably about five years old. He would, like, take me to the movies, and he really tried to be that father figure to me, but couldn't stay out of trouble and so when he went back to jail like he would write to me and I would write back and that was our way of communicating. Dear Alicia, hello honey and how are you doing? I haven't heard from you in a while and neither has grandma. I want so bad never to hurt you again and I feel like I am because I'm still here. Every day I wake up wondering if today will be the day that my name is called. The stress is almost unbearable. My when I first found out about the incident and my mind was just like, I told him to call me if something was wrong. I need to talk to him. I need to get answers from him. What made them get together with this one guy and do what they did? Whose idea was it? Was it just one or was it both or did it just happen? It's just like, there's no easy answer and I might not like the answer I get, but it's all, it's all just why. The details of 26-year-old Joshua Komazarjewski's past are more in-depth and some say even more disturbing. His rap sheet reveals a quick and consistent... We were right in the kitchen here and we got a call from my brother Ben and he said, I think Josh has been involved in this home invasion. And I said to him, I said, home invasion? This was a murder. And Josh was involved? So you see the name spelled out, the Komaszewski name, and you sit there and you hold your head in your hands and you can't believe it. And you want to cry. This young man's a monster. And that is not the way that we, as members of this family, behave. We spent all of our time in Cheshire. And we lived in a home that was a home of arts and letters. This is my aunt Vera Komasashevsky, one of the foremost actresses in the Russian stage. And there's a theater in St. Petersburg that's named after her. And this is my father, Theodore Komasashevsky, theater director, architect, costume designer. When we drove up to Cheshire, my brother's house was just swarmed with media, knocking on the door, trying to get statements from them. I think it's hard for anybody to be able to deal with that kind of a situation. But probably more so for them, because they were individuals who basically had withdrawn from many aspects of public life. They ultimately posted a notice on the outside of their door. But that was it. And from that time on, they've had nothing to say. It was so disappointing because I knew I was the last person therapeutically that met with Josh and could really paint a picture of him in a different light. And I knew that the media and most people's opinion of him would go against what I saw and what I knew. Josh just wanted to do better things with his life, staying clean, reconnecting with his family, 
and possibly going forward with an education to become an architect. I saw someone who created some beautiful designs, these sketches. I mean, this kid was amazing. This is something that's unnatural. This is a pure talent. He had to have practiced this and worked on this for years. But when we talk about the, just the pure evil. Joshua was a little skinny, frail kid. I saw him behind the bars. He had on his uh, cream-colored uh, jail uniform. He was slight. He was polite. He's adopted. He went from regular school, special ed, to homeschool. This whole package didn't make sense to me. Burglary, 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 and burglary. Genius that he is, and he is a genius in, in some respects, with a photographic memory and uh, uh, attention to detail that uh, no normal mind could possibly uh, retain. He told them every burglary he did. He knew every item he took, passports, what dumpsters he threw it in. Joshua could get into the third floor, steal things, know which denominations of bills he took a year later, two years later, tell you where each wallet was, what kind of pants they were taken from, where the pants were on the floor, on the bedpost, in the closet. Stay there for hours, not get caught. Joshua used a relatively sophisticated equipment for a burglar, night vision goggles, latex gloves. After he'd robbed the house, he would stay there on occasion and listen to the people breathing. He'd go from room to room listening to the occupants breathing for no apparent purpose. Um, that was the frightening part of it. He robbed state troopers' houses, which takes some guts. And I said, Judge, he needs to be watched. This, this kid is sick. You're never going to see him again, or he's going to be the worst criminal to pass through these doors, because that's the kind of a mind he's got. There's no obvious flag here. No obvious flag. The new chairman of the board of pardons and parole says that the two suspects in the brutal Cheshire home invasion and triple murder were capable of doing what they allegedly did. There's no evidence that we've seen yet that they were uh, recently uh, failed any drug tests. They were both employed. They were both living in what appeared to be stable households. Kamasayevsky was arrested for 18 home invasions. And the warning bells in there should have been ringing very loudly. Under a 10-year-old law, the prosecutors are supposed to order a transcript of the sentencing proceeding and send that along to the parole board. I mean, I used to be a prosecutor. And I helped write this, this law I'm talking about because I knew that it's at the sentencing that you really find out everything you need to know about this offender and the crime. The problem is none of this ever got to the Department of Corrections. None of this ever got to the parole board. So from the point of view of the Department of Corrections, they got first time ever incarcerated inmate. Young, white, bright, homeschooled, remorseful, never identified as a person with high mental health needs because he didn't come across as that type of person. He was a real a manipulator. The typical sentence for burglary is a maximum of 10 years in prison for each offense. Komisoyevsky could have still been locked up for two lifetimes. It was possible. It didn't happen. to open the new account, and Mrs. Pettit was at the counter. All I saw was white blonde hair and a white piece of paper, the teller handing it to the manager, and the manager really just running right behind me to her office. And she just left. It's very delicate. Three lives were taken that should not have been. 
things happened in a manner that, and I'm not saying the police, because when you have a hostage situation, you wait until you, uh, you have to assess. But she was screaming for her life. He's in the basement, conscious, bound by the ankles, daughter loose upstairs, She's a very strong girl. How did it happen? Cheshire police, no one is talking? N no one. Lieutenant, good morning, sir. Good morning, Dan. First of all, uh, uh, the Cheshire Police Department in their response to, uh, uh, to this initial call was, was absolutely outstanding. Uh, they did a stellar job. Uh, the chief and all those uh, personnel in uh, Cheshire PD deserve a lot of praise and credit. People are asking about a timeline, you know, when did this occur, when did that occur? We, we don't detail that information. That's, that's, that's not something that, that really the public really needs to be concerned about at this point in time, and it has more of an impact on, on, on the case itself. Um, you know, the type of injury, the, the uh, scene that one may try to envision in their mind, we're not going to detail that. We're not going to discuss, um, you know, how someone died. Uh, over and above manner and cause, which will give manner and cause of death, but we're not going to get into great graphic detailed description. Um, you know, we're not going to talk about assaults. We're not going to talk about weapons. Say what we don't know. What happened? In the next... In the ensuing half hour. Yeah. Between the time... Hayes and Hawk Pettit returned home. Mm hmm And the time, I don't want to say the first Cheshire police. No. They were arrested coming out of the house? Time that they were arrested. Yeah. That may only be answered at trial. If you can answer some of the questions, go ahead and do that. Yep. And then... Uh... There's so little information, and there's so many rumors and innuendo circulating. People are clamoring to find out what happened. Did they possibly propose that William Pettit was somehow involved? Speculation. The sooner I think we get all the information, the sooner folks can really start healing. It's the unknown is just as frightening as what happened in a way. You have all these people saying all this stuff, you know? Just tell us what happened. And uh, then we can deal with it. It's almost like not knowing is... kind of keeps the wound open, you know? It's going to be a while till we see trial, so. It's starting to pan out that the state's claim is pretty strong, overwhelmingly strong. And that what's at stake at this case is, is life or death. You have the gasoline aspect of it. You know, the sexual assault, horrible crime scene photos. You have the right defendant. You have the right perpetrator. What do we do? Isn't this the case that death is warranted? And, um, and I can't accept that. Once you allow the death penalty to go forward, then the next case comes along. And it's okay for the next case because that crime was horrifying. And what's if that's a mistake? What's if that's an innocent guy? And this notion of that, though, if you execute somebody, you know, you'll save money. You know, that's the furthest thing from the truth. You know, we have pretty much a blank check. So I'm reminding everybody, listen, Stephen Hayes is ready to plead guilty to all of these charges and take a sentence of life without the possibility of release. It'll be over now. You know, there'd be... The case would be done, there wouldn't be any appeals, we'd stop spending all this money, um, we would not have to traumatize everybody with the facts of this case.
as a United Methodist minister. I am a minister of a church at large that is opposed to capital punishment. That has put me between a rock. We certainly don't um, approve of torture of people, uh, but uh, we feel that uh, there has to be some justice in uh, how people are dealt with when they are so inhumane in their treatment of others. You know, it just makes me want to cry. Jennifer Haley and Michaela, they were kind and they were sweet. They looked out for other people, they cared about other people, and uh, spent their time helping people. So for them to suffer, you know, horrific, horrific deaths seems incredibly unjust. I mean, it would seem incredibly unjust for anybody, but obviously they were the three people that I knew and loved the best in the world. And uh, it's just the contra, the contra, the, the opposition of the just absolute evil that attacked us versus the goodness that they represented. It's, it's just worlds apart. A benign visit to the grocery store to get milk, bread, toilet paper. Oh, and People Magazine. Because a family that my brother killed is on the front cover. And my brother's picture is in it. He raped a woman. He choked her to death. He poured gasoline and he peed, he peed funny. And so they threw him back and they paroled him five months later. I personally, they're fucking stupid because they don't get it. You don't care enough about the people in your society to put these type of people back out on the street. And I want to say that it's really tough for me to say because one of those people is my brother. Stephen at birth or soon thereafter? Stephen around three. Stephen around five. Matthew around one, Matthew around three. And we get into these. Stephen, Matthew, Brian. Where I got the blonde hair, I have no idea. Dad, that's where you got it. You, Catherine, and and uh, Stephen all had the light hair. Who is Steve? He's manipulating. He's uh, deceptive. And he's my brother. But look at that. Yeah. And I, I remember that. See, look at where his hands are. I remember that day. He was pinching me. He was grabbing me. I mean, look, I'm about to freaking burst out in tears here. <laughs> He's just laughing his little ass off. Yeah. Fucking nudge. Deceiving. Always. Manipulator. Mom, it's not me, it's Matt. Yeah. Mom and her three boys. And that's probably the first Christmas since 1979 that all three of us were in the same room for Christmas. Only to go back to jail again. Mm-hmm. You know, this is the evolution of Stephen in prison life. Monday, when I saw it on the news, all I heard was that there was the home invasion and whatnot, and it seemed like something Steve would do. But with, if he never... With the smashing of the police cars and the breaking and entering and stuff like that. But I the mean, killing, the raping, and the burning. That could have been Josh. I don't know who was the mastermind. It, well, it, obviously, it, neither one of them, because they got caught, and they did something... Well, being Terrible. a mastermind doesn't mean that you don't get caught. And honestly, you know, it is. It's, it, it is the equivalent of the perfect storm. If he wasn't smoking drugs, then, you know, I say flip the switch and f fuck the trial. Flip the switch. I, I hope it doesn't even go that far. As, as nasty as it sounds, I hope somebody puts a bullet in his head. That's not going to happen. Outside the courtroom. He's in solitary confinement. Yeah, well, they will they will keep him they, away from every god living soul. When he's on his way into the courtroom, he has to get out somewhere. They're not going to risk his life because the state wants to kill him. 
they're not going to give that privilege up to anybody I, else. You know, I think that it should be the death penalty. Both my daughters, Clarice and Caroline, had a relationship with Joshua. And I believe that he picked my daughters out due to the fact that they look like they're very young. When Josh wanted to marry Caroline, we had a phone conversation. I don't know if Josh was asking for my blessing, but in that phone conversation, I said, Joshua, I, I have two major concerns. One is, I think you're a career criminal. And then the second thing I shared with him is that he's a pedophile. And in both of those, he, he never really changed his voice. Um, all I remember him saying is, I'm sorry you feel that way. Dear Caroline, good evening, sweetheart. When I wake every morning, the sun is just starting to rise. Its light dances across your picture, radiating your beautiful eyes and pretty smile. It's the best part of the day. A calming mix of hope, beauty, and tranquility. Take care, Caroline. Smile. Someone's thinking of you. Strength and honor. Sincerely, Joshua. P.S. Miss you. We called Joshua the hopeless romantic. That was the biggest side I loved about him. Because... How many guys are out there that are romantic? You know, not very many. And he was super romantic, and that's the way I am. I'm super romantic. When I went to Cheshire, we would go around to neighborhoods, the rich neighborhoods, and he'd look at all these houses and be like, man, you know, I want to live in something that nice and that gorgeous. And he wanted to have a family. And he's like, I want a family, you know, a good family. I don't want something that's broken. If I were home, I would have sent flowers and some sort of creative surprise with this little note of admiration. Actually, if I were home, I would have shown up in person and, well, who knows. Me and Joshua did have a very sexually active relationship, and he did like to tie me up. And, of course, you know, I was the submissive one, and sometimes I was the dominant one. But most of the time, I was submissive. Joshua always asked me, you know, is this too tight? Are you okay? Joshua always was concerned. Joshua was definitely a soulmate, and that's what killed me the most. I saw Steve and Josh together every day, every day. Um, they were always talking. Um, because Steve was, Steve was very, very versed in recovery. Um, Steve knew the N.A. book back and front. His nickname was Mr. N.A. And I think Josh kind of absorbed a lot of it and was able to get that knowledge from Steve. For this addict, drugs are not my main problem. I am my main problem, my self-destructive attitude and behavior. What I like about getting high is to escape my feelings. I've self-medicated so much I don't know how to feel anymore. This is his own words. He's writing this. Unresolved anger controls me. It haunts me day and night, sometimes to the point of obsession. Even scary fantasy. You know, one of the comments that Stephen had shared with me was, he didn't know what was going to happen, but something big had to happen because he had to get away from my mother's house. May to July, uh, in a one-bedroom apartment, my mother in the bedroom, Stephen on the couch, me on the floor. You know, I didn't ever want to be home. I just didn't. So I'd stay out until I had to come home to go to sleep because I couldn't stand to be in the same room with him. 
and then I'd be lying, making believe I'm sleeping in the morning while he's having coffee with my mom, just running all his bullshit out of his mouth about how he's going to take care of her and he's going to maybe make all this money. He's going to reshift and reshape my mother's life and get them a bigger place. And, you know, it's going to be Stephen taking care of mom. And on a scale from here to here, there was that much of me that actually believed it was going to happen. We got into a very physical confrontation one night, and he broke three of my ribs and gave me a black eye. And, you know, I probably should have had him arrested then because that would have been violation of probation. And he would have went to jail and none of this would have ever happened. Things were already falling apart. The lies that Stephen had been telling for the last two months were coming back. My mother was finding out about it. She was getting ready to boot him out. I don't care what you have to do. You need a halfway house. I, I don't care. Get out of my house. So that was Friday. I don't know the specifics of what happened Saturday and or Sunday, but, you know, things were definitely ramping up to something. A day or two before the crime occurs, Stephen saw that his life was once again going downhill. And he says that he locks himself in a hotel room with uh, crack cocaine uh, and heroin and goes on this drug binge with a desire and hope that he would kill himself. He leaves the hotel room feeling like he's failed at this suicide attempt leaving him, in his view, more desperate. He shows up at an AA meeting in Hartford, and there's Joshua. And Joshua started talking to him about ways to make some real money. The last contact I had with him before the crime, I think, was Sunday night. And we said our usual good night, you know, I love you. And then the next morning, I tried to get a hold of Joshua. Me and my mom were walking to the car, and I looked at my mom and go, Mom, something's wrong. I was like, Joshua's not answering his phone. I think something happened. I was like, something definitely is wrong. Miss <laughs> Kamazar Jeffsky did call me on, I'm pretty sure it was Monday, and she told me that Joshua went out late that night, and he was wearing dark clothing like his hoodie. And... Ms. Komazar Jeffsky told me that he only does that when he's going out to rob houses. The lights that the candles make, I think, can help to radiate the, uh, uh, the love that's needed. Well, they're going to ring the bells at uh, the churches for three minutes, uh, one minute for each of the pettit women. as a random home invasion and of course the darkness that happened on that day will never be forgotten but perhaps for the first time tonight there is a glimmer of hope that perhaps some good could come from this evil now the money raised here will stay in connecticut and will go to the foundation that was founded by dr pettit in the names of his daughters mckaylee miracle and Haley. Good morning. Good morning. 
This is a hearing in a, a continued hearing in a matter of a complaint brought by Colin Poitras in the Hartford Current against Chief Fire Department Town of Cheshire. Town we applied to the Town of Cheshire for more material uh, right after the crime took place. We finally got new information yesterday, a complete transcript from the time of the initial call from the bank official regarding Mrs. Pettit being at the bank, saying she might be held hostage, to the time the two suspects were arrested outside the Pettit household. And our review of this document, which is heavily edited to protect potential witnesses, uh, the town has told us, raises the possibility that officers on alert could have maybe stopped this car with a suspect of Mrs. Pettit as they were coming home from the bank, um, perhaps could have beat them back to the house, could have separated the two suspects at that time, and maybe things would have had a different outcome. And, and what's still out there is no one knows what the initial 911 call said, what the bank official said to police when she called. What were they told? Was it clear? Did they know they have a hostage crisis? There's always more information that is yearned for, um, either in a, a journalistic sense, uh, a due diligence reporting sense, and sadly in a salacious sense. So it is hard to say no. I don't have anything to tell you right now, over and over again. Upon arrival at the victim's residence, the first officer observed the private residence fully engulfed in flames. Yeah, it, it worked out so officers arrived on scene just as the suspects were leaving the residence. I get really tired of the stories that say, oh, by the time the police showed up, the house was already in flames. And when Billy came out of the house, he was pretty sure that he saw men in the woods hiding behind trees, and we think those were all the police officers. And he was calling out to a neighbor while hopping across the yard, tied and badly beaten. That should have raised the police eyebrows to say, what are they doing in there? We need to get in there and find out. That's why I wrote letters to the police. I felt like, and I expressed in my letter, that, that their, their goal was to catch the, the men, whoever were guilty, and uh, above and beyond the saving of lives. And I felt they, their priorities were very much askew. Why didn't they just have a bullhorn or something saying, you know, this house is surrounded, you're not going to get out of this uh, alive, so come on out. Why didn't you just go to the door and break a window or something and go into that house? You know, my, my whole in, inner person said, these were precious people. Why didn't you enter the house? We've asked a lot of questions, written a lot of letters, but they have not sat with me and they have not sat with my parents to tell us what happened and what unfolded and why and how. I believe that truly they think they did something wrong. I've heard all kinds of things that it was a small town and they hadn't had the experience in the past. I think they were afraid. I just can't say enough uh, good things about how proud I am of the extraordinary effort of our police officers and our firefighters. Um, they're extremely well trained. They're a great group of professionals. And I think today exemplified um, the finest of, of what the police and fire are all about in this community. And I can't thank them enough because without their great work, um, this could have been a far worse tragedy. Uh, we were very, very fortunate. I was just literally shocked when I heard him say that and that there were no further casualties or something and I thought you know how bad does it have to be I mean I thought it was awful and he was commending them on what a great job they had done and I I was sorry but I didn't feel they did a great job I mean if they had done a great job nobody would have died As you look through this dispatch, you can't help but walk away thinking, you know, that there's another tragedy within the tragedy that occurred to the Pettit family here.
92128. Initial call comes in to the police department 911. And this is the call that was actually from the bank manager. I will watch and see what kind of car she gets into. I'm in my office with the door, with the lights off. My teller said that she saw the driver. He had a black hood over a hoodie and a baseball cap on. I'm going to keep you on hold for another couple minutes, right? Okay. Some police officers were actually at the scene within seconds or minutes of when Stephen Hayes and Jennifer Pettit get back to the house. They had the phone number of the house early on. Nobody made a call. Um, nobody knocked on the door. 9.56, two suspects are moving into Chrysler. 9.57, there is a fire also at the scene. The initial call comes in at 9.21. This is over a half an hour later. They were actually at the scene for 30 minutes. The strangulation of Jennifer Pettit occurred. The rape of Jennifer Pettit occurred. The pouring of gasoline occurred throughout the house. And the actual setting on fire of the house. All of this is taking place while the police are watching the house, setting up their perimeter. It's really outrageous. today on Talk of the Town. We're going to take a quick break, and when we come back, we're going to be joined by Dr. William Pettit from the Pettit Family Foundation. High school senior. Yeah. 1984. There was no audio for me. We go directly to you. Dr. Pettit is here, and as many of you recall, you know, it wasn't that long ago that, you know, you suffered a tragedy losing your wife and your two daughters in a home invasion. Um, talk a little bit, if you will, Dr. Pettit, about the mission, about the mission of the Pettit Family Foundation. It's essentially to help out people with uh, chronic illnesses, which was a, a, a nod to Haley, who was accepted at Dartmouth and wanted to major in uh, biology and consider medicine or other careers and to help people affected by uh, violence in their life, which there's obviously uh, far too much of is evidenced by the shootings in Oakland and the shootings in Pittsburgh. There are a few things that make me mad as hell, and one is um, when I heard that the legislature was um, even talking about, even considering abolishing the death penalty here in Connecticut. And I'm beginning to wonder, do I have anything in common with this state anymore? I mean, what the heck? One of the studies that has been done, and it is, does get brought up by Study, people. study, study. Well, this study is actually has some very good statistics, which are most violent criminals who commit the most heinous of crimes don't see the death penalty as a deterrent because their, their sociopathic activities don't take into account consequences. How do you feel about that, Dr. Pettit? Death penalty is clearly a deterrent because the person who's committed the violent crime can no longer commit it again, so that person is removed from society, and I think they've forfeited their right to live in a civil civilized society, and uh, the taking of a, a life, the opponents like to say it's uh, murder by the government, but that's a semantic uh, issue because murder is the unlawful taking. We have laws set down for, for certain reasons, and certainly the defense attorneys spend lots of time and lots of our money using the law to their benefit. And uh, the law says that for certain crimes, there's, there's an ultimate penalty, and society's believed in that for thousands of years. And that fight will continue, and I know that is uh, one, of, one of the things you're going to fight passionately uh, to make sure that those laws stay in place. And, um, and uh, no better spokesman than you, Dr. Pettit, for why these laws are here. State lawmakers are considering a bill that would change the death penalty law, and Dr. William Pettit gave his opinion in the same day of a hearing for one of the... Men. Death penalty opponents speak of the inviolable sanctity of life. They love slogans such as, do not kill in our name, and the like. Thus, I assume that death penalty opponents value the lives of murderers more than their victims. Specifically to me, as a victim, 
you, you know, if you're for the death penalty, this is the poster child, no question about it. If you're against the death penalty, like I am, this guy is the poster child for the death penalty. I mean, him and Saddam Hussein, right? There's kind of hard to argue the case. Uh, but it's not a philosophical debate anymore. This is reality. And the ordeal you have to go through once it's a death penalty case is considerable. It's a guaranteed multiple years ordeal in terms of just the trial and after the conviction, scores of years of appeals and frustration. And all this time, the focus is on the murderers. They become mini celebrities. You have to go into gruesome detail about what happened because the prosecutors must prove that the aggravating factors outweigh the mitigating factors. And the aggravating factor is unusually cruel and heinous. In other words, you have to prove that compared to other triple murders, this one is much worse. Once this gets underway, people are not gonna like what they see, and it's just starting to get underway now. And so I guess I'd say to Dr. Pettit, you know, I, I don't know who's giving you advice, but I, I think if anyone's implying to you that there's a realistic hope that these guys would ever actually be executed, I think they're misleading you. The one and only time we had an execution here in my lifetime in Connecticut was this guy, Michael Ross. And that was after 25 years of drama to get to that point, and the guy asked to be executed. The reality is that you'll feel like you're making progress every day, but it's gonna go on forever. probably be two years before they even start selecting of the jury. Getting pretty old. I hope I live long enough that I can attend the trial. I want to see justice done. Attention, Detective Fran Budwitz of the Connecticut State Police. I give this statement to aid and assist those who now have the burden and huge responsibility of seeking justice. My earliest memories of Steve go back to age four or five. Steve presented himself as the apple of everyone's eye. What many people did not see was the brother I knew. Being young and naive, I arrived home from school in seventh grade. Stephen and his friends were using the oven to try out some marijuana. He turned on the burner on the stove. He told me it was really cool and put my hand over it. It's cool, you won't get hurt. As soon as I put my hand over the burner, he pushed my hand onto the hot burner. And I had ring scars that lasted for months. To say there hasn't been a history of violence, well, this should, this should serve to say the predisposition was there. It was always there. Within two months of moving, Steve took my mother's car in the middle of the night. Upon calling the police, the relationship with my mom, Stephen, and the law enforcement officials began. Stephen is not sick. Stephen is cunning and calculating. Please exercise discretion. I will assist how I can. However, there is enough to hang him without any family involvement. Stephen is alone. He will answer to God. He will answer to the law and my prayer is he will answer to himself before fate hands him his final sentence. I'd like to be there from the beginning of each trial through the end of each one. If there are things to look at that they had to endure, I feel like it's part of my life to know what they lived through or died through. And I just feel like it's not to punish ourselves, it's just to know in the end and have that finality of 
oh, this is how it looked. This is what they say they did. A thief in the night, I've come to steal not jewels and money, but your personal safety, privacy, and security. I violate your inner asylum of intimacy. I piss on your optical illusion of peace and innocence. I feast on your animosity. The Pettit family pass through their fear into calm waters of abject terror, like mesmerized rabbits cornered by a spring predator. To see that fear, that emotional pain I feel every day manifested on another's face validates that this pain in me is real. The shockwaves of my self's hopelessness reverberated its bitterness through my rock soul at the realization that I crossed life's bridge of depravity. The awakening of my shadow, repressed within, reaching its zenith that morning with rapturous control of Michaela. Her age was insignificant. Come on, shadow. Come on, honey. On the phone, Joshua denied raping the 11-year-old, but I knew Joshua raped that 11-year-old. I just knew. And he kept, Joshua kept telling me that he didn't, and I didn't believe him. I couldn't believe him because I was raped in ninth grade. And I left. I told him about it. I know he didn't know Michaela at the time, but I feel like maybe he was thinking of a Michaela while he was doing that stuff to me. Punishment that would be good enough for him would be having done to him what he'd done to them. Suspects, but Stephen Hayes goes on trial first. He is in court today, but he looks very different from his bug shot. He's lost weight. He's in a regular striped shirt and pants. No handcuffs on him in front of the jury. And it is because this case has gotten so much publicity that picking an impartial jury could be difficult. Sonny, you were inside the courtroom today. What sort of state uh, did, did Commissar Jeski appear to be in? He's much heavier now. He sort of has a buzz cut. Commissar Jeski uh, is dressed in a suit and engaged in the process. Now, if you're wondering how long this is all going to last, we're talking about several months. This morning, the judge told From the courthouse, I don't think Cheshire's but about a 15-minute drive. Everybody knew this case. Terry Nichols, Timothy McVeigh, the Oklahoma City bombing cases were number two and three. Coma Zajewski was number one. Talking to almost 2,000 prospective jurors, everyone, had made conclusions based on the publicity. And that conclusion was very clear. Joshua Komazajewski was guilty. 75% also expressed the opinion that Joshua should die. I've never had a jury selection where people would jump out of the seats. I'll kill him now. What's in the news, internet? How could you miss it? What did you think when you saw him? Um, I did think he's a murderer. Frustrating day, but two more jurors were selected. That came in at 8.13 this morning. Still need four more jurors, six alternates, and two substitutes. It was about 11 o'clock this morning, my time, Pacific time, and uh, one of Stephen's attorneys called. 
They went in to check on him this morning, and uh, he was unresponsive. Stephen's lying in a coma induced by, you know, a medical team. They're not sharing why. You know, the attorney said that he could very well die. And they're expected to be back in court tomorrow. They can't proceed without him in the room. Stephen squirreled away nine or so doses of Thorazine and Clonopin. And you, you might question how this could happen. About a year before this, Stephen Hayes had made a suicide attempt. And one of the things they found in his cell was a suicide note. I quote, I am sorry. All I want to do is die. It is the only way to end the pain I go through every day, 24-7. And more important, the pain that trial will bring to others. Time to go to the last undiscovered country. Although I am not the monster that Josh is, I am one nevertheless. A coward, because I could not do what was right. Looking back on my life, I was nothing but a self-centered asshole who cared only of himself. But the ironic facet to this is I have always had the ability to change. But cowards don't change. They become me. The judge actually toured Hayes' cell yesterday. It's called the safe cell, which will protect him from harming himself. We learned a lot. He also wears something called Ferguson clothing, which an inmate wears if they're in jeopardy of killing themselves because they can't tear up the clothes and use it as a noose. Is it on? Yep. How difficult, Dr. Pettit, is it to sit in there and have them discuss Hayes' uh, conditions in prison for two hours at a time, the lights being on? Uh, it's uh, difficult. Uh, somehow it's okay for the uh, defendants to bind us and beat us and tape, uh, rip, rape us and torture us and set the place on fire, but you uh, can't, be, can't be held in a, in a cell with the lights on and some others, uh, something wrong with that. It's surreal. The entire prosecution is geared to killing Stephen Hayes. And so here he is trying to kill himself, but we won't let him do that because we want to extract our pound of flesh. It's, it's really a sick kind of process, in my opinion. cameras allowed in the courtroom so you're not going to see what's actually going on in there but tweeting is allowed a juror has been excused because she said she couldn't be fair because she heard news reports of Stephen Hayes suicide attempt this jury will end up making two decisions one will be the guilt or innocence of the defendant and if they find him guilty then they would have to decide if he should get the death penalty for the crime Going into the courtroom, Stephen Hayes was like off to my left. I look at him and I think, I still can't believe that you did this. I said as soon as I found out that my sister died, just come into me, be a part of me. So I kept staring at him. And sometimes I think, is that a part of her? saying, like, stare at him, don't take your eyes off of him, like, he, he can't be trusted. I'd like to say a few things to these guys. I'd like them to answer me the question, do they know what it is to be terrorized? After waiting more than three years, the Pettit and Hawk families are ready for this process to finally begin. 
and are hopeful in the end that justice will prevail. And we think of Jennifer, Haley, and Michaela every second of every day. It is a system, you know, and people say it's the best system in the world, but it's a, it's a maddening system at best. People spend a lot of time parsing words instead of really trying to get to what is right and what is wrong, what is good and what is evil. But it's the system we have, so we're, we're, hoping, we're hoping that the system we have will give us justice. Today's date is July 23rd, 2007. Statement is taking place at the Cheshire Police Department headquarters. Joshua, comma, suggest. Do you know why you're here? For a uh, home invasion gone terribly wrong. Okay. And you went to stop and shop in Cheshire? I was waiting for a contractor uh, to make payment. While waiting, I saw a mother and a daughter. For whatever reason, I chose to follow the mom and the daughter um, to their house and saw that they lived in a very nice house. I thought it would be nice to be there someday. On the night of July 22nd, Josh and Stephen were texting each other. Stephen texting Josh about, when are we going to get going? Uh, it, was, it was kind of like an excitement about going to burglarize his house. He drives down to Cheshire. He and uh, Josh go to a bar. And then they start looking for uh, from when they were shopping at Stop and Shop earlier. It's always been my opinion that he was attracted by the young girl, Michaela, rather than the money, the Mercedes. Josh was born into a family with a history of mental problems. Then he was adopted by a family that had no ability to cope with mental problems. And so he was doomed by biology, and then he was doomed by fate. When Josh was three years old, uh, the family took into the home uh, two foster children, a girl and a boy. And Josh underwent really horrible and extensive sexual abuse at the hand of Scott. I think it started off playing little sex games, um, having him pose naked, and then it proceeded to full-scale anal intercourse and to, and to Josh as being burned with cigarettes. Against the background of all of this, uh, Josh is in a church in which it, it is taught that there is evil in the world and probably the greatest abomination of all is, is homosexuality. And so you've got a, what, a five-year-old, a six-year-old, a seven-year-old you know, li listening to this and thinking to himself that, that I am fundamentally evil. I have engaged in that kind of activity and really not being able to tell anybody about it. There's a theme that I saw in Stephen's life of, of betrayal. Stephen had been sexually abused as a child, which led him to become more emotionally uh, disconnected from people. The turning towards drugs and the desperate state of mind that he found himself in, all of this helped explain how Stephen could have done what he had done. And Mr. Hayes and I made our way over to the house and donned face masks and put on rubber gloves. And we noticed that the father was uh, sleeping downstairs. I could see Mr. Hayes in the window uh, motioning to to strike him and get it over with. And, uh, I hit him in the head with a baseball bat and he let off this unworthy scream and just kept hitting him until he finally packed up into the corner of the couch. Uh, Mr. Hayes and I uh, proceeded up the stairway. 
Strays put his hand over Mom's mouth and shook her uh, gently awake. I followed suit with the youngest uh, the daughters. I tied her feet and Mr. Ace tied her hands. We put um, pillowcases over the occupants' heads. Um, yeah. yeah, so that they couldn't see us. And then went into KK's room and sat down and we were talking about school and summer plans. And I got her a glass of water. KK, uh, obviously, she told you her nickname or whatever is KK, or you made that up? No, that's the name that both her sister and her mother uh, referred to her oh. as. I met Josh when I was 13. Josh's parents started attending the church that we went to, the Evangelical Bible Church. And we dated, we were in a relationship for about two years. Um, we started um, dating when I was 14 or 15 and then our relationship was ended by the church. Throughout the whole course of our relationship, we were always trying to not have sex. That was the goal. It felt deeply, deeply sinful. Our church community was our homeschool community. And Josh's family, and mine as well, had a very specific idea of good and evil. The devil was understood to be an entity that you could know. So if Josh had anxiety, it was the devil. If he did something wrong, it was because he was being used as an agent of the devil. Josh spoke some to me about the sexual abuse that had happened to him, but there wasn't even a way for him to tell me without weeping. Josh had terrible anxiety attacks. His home was not ever safe for him. The safe place was being away and hiding in the woods. He was trespassing and sneaking around, spying on people long before it was a criminal offense. I think that he envied people and he would daydream about being them. They find beer in the refrigerator and drink throughout the night. Stephen finds jars of quarters and coins. They found the Bank of America book and they're waiting for the morning. However, Stephen worries that he's gonna leave DNA evidence in the house and he starts uh, obsessing and Josh tells him, fire destroys everything. We'll get the people out and we'll burn the house down. We'll get them somewhere and then we'll get the hell out of here. That's what Stephen was thinking about. Stephen goes into the garage, he finds containers and starts driving to find a gas station. When Stephen gets back with the gasoline, Josh had changed the clothes of Michaela because of activity that he was involved with in terms of sexually abusing her. And part of that occurred while Stephen was out on the gas run, because we know that because of Josh's photographs that he took on his cell phone before the bank. first set of photographs, you know, showed Michaela. There were leg shots and genital area shots, but they were clothed. The last shots while they were at the bank were much more graphic. Really awful, awful, awful photographs. Those are the kinds of things you never forget. They kind of become emblazoned in your mind. It just shows the level of depravity of Joshua Komazajewski.
Joshua was committed against the wishes of his parents. He was committed uh, and spent, I think, uh, two weeks at Elmcrest. He was clearly in terrible shape and suicidal. The records are very clear that Joshua wanted to try the medication. Joshua wanted the therapy, but the parents rejected it. Not only did the parents reject it, but they immediately took him up to the Walton Bay Christian Center. People would say that he was seeing demons, and he believed that, and would pray that they go away. And people would gather around him and pray over him and lay hands on him and speak in tongues over him. Exorcism, that was kind of a regular part of our lives when it came to dealing with anxiety. He ended up breaking into my room at the discipleship house to come and see me. He was essentially excommunicated for doing that. His whole life, everything was just gone overnight. There was no addressing that perhaps this was a desperate kid who actually didn't, wasn't wrestling with the devil, but had experienced trauma and was losing his grip. Some people called our office asking if we would, we would take Josh on in spite of some of his legal difficulties as a member of our, our tour. I just gave Josh a little bit of responsibility and let him know that I expected him to be a leader, and he blossomed. He just loved it. We came to the end of that tour, and it was, it was a good tour. I think it wasn't long after that that Josh joined the reserves. Then he was discharged, and then that's when his troubles started again. Morning rolls around. They uh, untie Mrs. Pettit. Stephen takes her to the bank. Mrs. Pettit is in the bank. It's taking longer than he thought. I went down to check on Dad, and then went into KK's room, and, you know, one thing led to another, and uh, I ended up performing oral sex on KK. You performed oral sex on KK? On KK. Her hands were tied, but her feet weren't. Did you take pictures of her? Uh, I did, yes. I had let her get dressed again, but before she did that, she uh, asked if she could take a shower. Now, you said you let her get dressed again. How, how is it she came upon being undressed? Because you originally said she was dressed. I had, uh, I used a pair of scissors and had cut her, her shirt off and her skirt off. No one disputes that he committed this crime. Eventually, he tells the police officer that while Hayes is gone, he goes upstairs and sexually assaults KK. At that point, the judge stops the tape. He says a juror is having problems with this testimony, with this evidence, and that he's going to stop it for the day, and they will continue again tomorrow. A very difficult day in court here, LaToya. Miss Arjeski was calling my youngest niece, KK. Like, you know, who are you to be using that term and calling her this, like, term of endearment that we use? Okay, you show me that baseball bat again that you hit Billy with, and, and I'll show you how it feels. You want them to lose a daughter. You want their house to burn down. You want them to see how it feels. And... And other times you think, gosh, who am I? Like, this is wicked. How could I wish this on anybody? Stephen is becoming anxious. He calls Joshua. Joshua tells him everything's going to be fine. The plan is going to work. After a period of time, Mrs. Pettit comes out of the bank with money. When they arrive back at the house, Stephen is under the belief that the crime is over, 
now they could leave. But Joshua tells Stephen that we have a problem. He had left DNA with one of the children and he had to kill them and they're dead. And Dr. Pettit had died from the injuries and that now he had to get his hands dirty and kill Mrs. Pettit. I believe Stephen, but from the first time that Josh talked to the police, he tried to save himself by blaming Stephen for all the horrific stuff that occurred. And uh, he had the money in his hands. He uh, says, uh, very matter of fact, thing, okay, you're, you're ready. We gotta, we have to kill them and burn the house down. I'm like, I'm not killing anyone. There's no way. Well, then, you know, I'll kill the two daughters and you can kill the mom. I was like, I'm not killing anyone. No one's dying by my hand today. And finally, he was like, fuck it, I'll, I'll take care of them. All three of them. Stephen tells me that he felt betrayed by Josh. He felt dragged into this horror of a crime. And he also felt, in a crazy way, betrayed by Mrs. Pettit because he looks out the window when he sees police cars. And he realizes that Mrs. Pettit must have informed bank officials. He is triggered into this state of rage. He strangles Jennifer Hawk Pettit. Uh, he pulls out her pants. Uh, he pulls her legs up. And he vaginally rapes her after he strangles her. I hear this noise down in the basement. Which is where the dad was. Which is right where the dad was. I jumped up, um, screaming to Steve that the father just took off. I could see behind Steve that uh, the mother was uh, laying lifelessly on the floor and her pants were down around her ankles. Stephen hears Josh telling him they have to leave, spread the gasoline and let's get out of here. He then went up the stairs um, with two bottles contemplating burning these, these two girls alive. I went to KK's room. Um, there was no gasoline in there. She was still in her bed, and I closed the door. And then I went down to the oldest daughter's room. I closed that door, and I went downstairs. Why did you close them. the doors? So I don't, I don't, you I knew don't they were tied, but you closed the doors. I didn't even think about a time. Like, I did for, for whatever stupid reason, like, the, just didn't cross my mind. Until he comes racing back down the stairs and he throws one of the empty bottles into the kitchen. Empty bottles of? Of, of gasoline. Of gasoline, so he went back up with another with bottle another of gas? another bottle of gas. He's stumbling with this oversized pack of matches and I can still see this person in the, the grass watching him. Okay. And the entire kitchen just it erupts, works. yeah, in like a sea of flame. I had already had my back turned and I'm running for the door. I fucked up, you know, I, I got myself in this horrible position, but, you know, they did, they, they did what they were supposed to do. There, there's no reason for them to die. these family members that have had to relive the horror of what happened inside of that home the night they were all tied up has been heartbreaking to watch inside of the courtroom the images have been absolutely devastating of the crime scene when it's and all put out in front of you it's very gruesome it's it's insane to just hear and it's just affected the whole town and it's like the whole town is just reliving it all again and it's not easy for all of us These are pictures of like the accelerant pattern that they showed how they went from like where Haley's body was upstairs into her bedroom and onto her bed and then down the hall and into Michaela's bedroom and onto her bed. And when they finally put the fire detective on the stand, I saw Michaela was tied and she 
had gasoline dumped on her while she was alive and alert and that at least Haley I know was probably burning while she was breathing and that was just a really hard thing to learn because I never really knew if the girls were alive when they were um, burning or not and it kind of was made true to us that that was the case with Haley that she had walked while she was on fire because she fell down and the front of her was more burned than the back of her. I was crying and I just felt like I wanted to get out of that courtroom and, and scream and just say, you know, I can't believe what's going on in there. You know, I just, it's making me so angry and I can't understand why somebody couldn't have ventilated that house for the girls while they were still alive. And I just, I want it to be so different. We're finally seeing the defense giving tough questioning to the Cheshire police officers who initially responded to the call of that home invasion. The officers said they followed protocol. Dr. William Pettit has always supported the actions of the Cheshire Police Department. One captain testifying that the incident did not make sense at first, and he said it still doesn't make sense today. Stephen admitted to killing the mob, he admitted to raping the mob, he admitted to spreading gasoline. I mean, so it's not like he was trying to get himself out from under in any way. And yet Josh was getting this story out that Stephen knew was false. Joshua tried to minimize the sexual assault, not make it out to be a rape, that it was just contact and ejaculation, which is absurd given the scientific evidence that exists. He tried to blame Stephen solely for being the person who initiated the gasoline and lighting the gasoline when there's gasoline on both of their clothes. Josh Komenzajewski was the one who was suggesting that they go into a house where uh, people were. And for Stephen, this was a foolish thing because he was obviously with a guy who um, was uncontrollable. And I think it haunts him, really haunts him, as to why he didn't walk away. Stephen's in an isolation cell, 24 hours a day. He has nightmares. He has nightmares about his own kid burning. This is the way his incarceration will last forever. So, you know, I don't know why we have to kill someone who's in a position like that. It's like being buried alive. We, the defense team, always believed that Joshua never had the intention to kill anybody. After he bashed Dr. Pettit's head several times, later on, he got a towel. He wiped the blood away from Dr. Pettit's head. He then got two pillows, put them behind his back, and he got two cushions. And his explanation, which is in his confession, was that he did so because he thought Dr. Pettit wasn't comfortable in those, and he was concerned about his comfort. Why didn't he simply walk in and undo the bindings? Dr. Leo Shea, a neuropsychologist, testified that Joshua was unable to make quick decisions in stressful situations. What occurred with Michaela uh, is absolutely unexplainable such a horrendous crime committed on such a, a young girl. People go to jail for a long time for crimes like that, but you don't get the death penalty. When Joshua was uh, apprehended, when he was pulled from the car, he was straight with the police. When Stephen Hayes was pulled from the car, he gave a phony name, and when asked, was there anybody in the house, he said, I don't know. When Joshua was pulled from the car, he gave his name, and he said, there's a woman inside, I believe she's dead, and upstairs there's two girls, and he expressed to the police that there was some urgency to the situation, which was pretty obvious because at that time the house was burning. Uh, this, to me, these are things that are inconsistent with intending to kill somebody. Oh, yeah. That's right. Yeah. You know, everybody 
everybody came here safe, you know, just to support. Yeah. You know, the teachers after Michaela died said, uh, whenever a uh, Whenever someone in the class. Dr. Uh, uh, Pettit, I just have to tell you that your daughter, Michaela, was always the one to go with the kid who was excluded. And I thank you for standing up for justice and what is morally and ethically correct. Dr. Pettit is, you know, pretty much out there with his foundation, which is obviously a really good thing and should be supported. But we're in the middle of the state trying to get the death penalty. So as much as I have incredible sympathy for him, I think his outspokenness uh, in this case uh, has really affected any ability to get a fair trial for either of these two defendants. What happened, what was said during that conversation with Dr. Pettit that made you just make a 180? Dr. Pettit came in with his sister-in-law, Mrs. Chapman. They said, if the legislature this year votes to repeal the death penalty, it'll make it harder for the jury to make the decision of the death penalty for this monster, this Coma Slajewski. I can That's only right. imagine that one-on-one -on -one conversation. You're sitting as close as probably we are now. You have no idea. I could not bring myself to cause this man any more stress. He's a monster. He is a monster. And I said, he's such a monster, they should hang him by his penis out from a tree in Main Street. Uh, I can't think of anything bad enough mm -hmm. that should happen to that man. I actually got to see Steve twice, well, past two Sundays. When I first saw him, I wanted to cry because I haven't seen him in so long, but I just didn't want to cry under those circumstances. You had all the guards standing right on top of you. And you can't talk about the trial because, like, you know that the phones are pretty tapped. I know that that family wants him to be dead and it all to be over with, but like my side of the family, we just want him to like take responsibility for what he did without the consequence of the death penalty. That won't bring anyone back. What happened happened and his death isn't gonna bring about much justice. Stephen Hayes walked into room 6A for the first time he saw a familiar face. It was his brother Matthew. The first time that we believe a Hayes family member has been in court. Prosecutor Michael Darrington said these two beautiful girls and loving mother were killed because Stephen Hayes wanted money. Defense attorney Thomas Ullman argued that life without parole is the harshest punishment Stephen Hayes could be given. Going through the view of Stephen, Stephen Hayes, Hayes okay. is finally in the hand of the jury. State's attorney Gary Nicholson did not mince words as he spoke to the jury in his closing arguments this morning saying that Joshua Komosarjewski is, quote, no shrinking violet. He played a starring role in this crime. Nicholson hammered the point that Komosarjewski was first in the house, the first to use violence, and had plenty of opportunity to leave the home. He gave Stephen Hayes directions back to the house when Hayes went and bought gas. It's not fair, is it? No. Yeah. No. Mm. You know, all I think of is the, the impact that our girls could have made upon the world. And of course,
course, none of that will ever come forth from Joshua Commissar Jeski. What's the jury weighing? Aggravating factors against mitigating factors. The aggravating factors brought out by the prosecution, the heinous nature of the crimes. For the mitigating factors that the defense presented, they pointed to a very difficult early childhood of Joshua Commissar Jeski. The defense said they turned to prayer instead. They also pointed to a series of concussions when he was a boy, drug use in his teenage and early 20 years, all saying it mitigates what happens. It means he didn't really know what was going on, couldn't make a decision to stop what was going on that night in July of 2007, and so his life should be spared. No verdict today. We do expect a verdict by the end of the week. We're good. You guys can reach, right? Oh, Lord, we gather around this table as family and friends. We stand at a place in the trial where we wonder what will take place. But we pray, oh God, that we will be able to be strong enough to accept whatever the outcome may be, that it would be your will that would be done. For we ask it in the name of Christ. Amen. Amen. This is all about death or life without parole. Really, it does seem like the most kind, humane thing you could do for a person is to allow them to just die. I thought of how, how much that challenges the jurors. A lot of pressure has been placed upon their shoulders. I'm glad I'm not in that room. Yeah. You never get those pictures out of their heads right. for the rest of their oh, lives. So, yes. You know. It's been uh, very traumatic for everyone. This is a case that has just rattled people. And a lot of people say that if there is a case that warrants the death penalty, uh, this is it. Wait a minute, I want to read you something that we're, uh, we're getting uh, some word on, and you might be able to explain it to us. The jurors are standing. The clerk is reading the verdict form. Count four, no statutory mitigators. Both aggravators are proven. Uh, OK, the defendant is sentenced to death, Sonny. The jury returns. Death penalty verdict. Death for the monster who slaughtered the Connecticut doctor's family. Tonight, a Connecticut jury has done something very rare. The Connecticut jury has recommended death for Stephen Hayes. He's convicted of raping and murdering a mom, Jennifer Hawk Pettit, and her two daughters, Haley and Kayla. The verdict was devastating. Stephen wanted a death verdict and knew we did everything in our power to prevent that from happening, in spite of his own efforts to kill himself. This case gets attention in Australia. It got attention in Europe. You know, this was any town America, any family America. And, and when you saw just how that was shattered in a few hours, I think that's how. Count five is death. <laughs> the second count, count five, the murder of Michaela Pettit, it's death. That he intentionally caused the death of a person under 16 years old. <laughs> All right, count 10 is death. That's, uh, he intentionally caused the death of Jennifer Hawk Pettit, the mother. Okay, count 11 is death. A couple of marshals came up behind Joshua in cuffs and really no reaction at all. Given the public outrage uh, for these horrendous crimes that we just couldn't get a fair jury here and we still feel that way and that's why we had filed a motion to change venue and we believe it should have been, should have been granted so that'll be one of the main appellate issues. <clears throat> I believe the death penalty is just barbaric and it puts us in line with countries like China, Yemen, Iraq, Iran. 
I don't know what other purpose it serves other than simply revenge. Walter Bansley III, thank you very much. Um, Denise, of course, yeah, we're going to have continuing coverage here. The uh, death penalty has been given to Joshua Crumbs. We are satisfied that the defendant has been judged to be the murderer, the rapist, and criminal that he is. And now he's been condemned to the ultimate penalty. We certainly have been criticized over the years that this is vengeance and bloodlust, but this is really about justice. We uh, want to go forward with the Pettit Family Foundation and try to continue to create good out of evil and but the defense did what they thought they should do. I thought a lot of it was particularly distasteful. We saw picture after picture after picture and every time one of those pictures went up I thought Charles Manson was a baby one irrelevant. I just like to thank our justice system as well as the jury members listening to a lot of things that they would much rather not heard or seen. I believe that without our defense attorneys we could not have the um, outcome that we have. So we have to even be appreciative that there are defense attorneys that will take cases like this. And I believe God's will has been done. I don't really want to answer any questions. I I feel I feel so sad that uh, my answers are really people here. I don't know if any of the other defense team death row now. Uh, there will be automatic appeals. There will be appeals upon appeals. Uh, this will go on for years and years and years. And, uh, as a matter of we offered to plead guilty to every charge in the information against us, so long as death wasn't the result. And so Joshua would have been sentenced to life without the possibility of release. It would have happened, you know, three weeks after the crime had taken place. Josh would have disappeared into the into the great abyss of the of the penal system and would never be heard from again. But that wasn't serious enough punishment for the state, and, and of course the state was being goaded on by Dr. Pettit. And so we had to go through three years of Hayes and Joshua and just forcing the people of Connecticut to relive that crime day after day after day, I think kind of, kind of coarsened the social fabric of Connecticut. It would be so much better just to throw those guys in jail and throw away the key, but. The difficult thing that I had to do in my life was to bury my own child and two grandchildren. I don't think there will ever be closure for our family. Jennifer was too much of a giving, loving person. And I don't think that we will ever, ever if we live another hundred years, would ever want to forget her. So if closure brings forgetting, I don't want that closure.